I love children's church. I love children's moment. They're so much fun. They're so much fun. We continue our journey together through our sermon series uh, entitled New Normal. We're going to talk about mistakes today. I know there's many of you out there that will not be able to relate to making mistakes, but bear with the rest of us who have made mistakes and and have enjoyed the, the forgiveness that God gives us in Christ Jesus. We want to share with you this morning John 21, 15 through 19, uh, which is a beautiful passage in John's Gospel where in some way, maybe even directly or indirectly, Jesus confronts Peter about a mistake, a sin he made uh, before the crucifixion and the resurrection, and that is Peter's denial of Christ on three different occasions in a very short period of time after Jesus had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and taken back to the religious leaders to face trial. And, and here is that beautiful moment that we would believe that Jesus has a time of reconciliation with Peter. And I love the way Jesus did it, and we want to point these things out this morning, that we may remember them and hold them in our hearts and minds as we journey forward in life and, and make the mistakes that uh, we may make as we truly, sincerely uh, try to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. So John 21, 15 through 19, New Living Translation. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. People do not like to make mistakes. I don't like to make mistakes. I made one in March, so I guess my quota for the year is filled that I want to share with you this morning. Uh, or maybe the quota of the mistakes that I want to share with you uh, have been fulfilled thus far uh, this year. Last summer, I purchased a new set of tires for the uh, minivan that I drive. And I was really excited about the purchase because I got a $70 rebate card back for purchasing that particular set of tires. And I waited and I waited for a few weeks and it finally came in the mail and I, I took the envelope and the card and I put it in my Bible bag and I began to anticipate what I would spend this $70 on, you know, and I'm, I'm excited. So a few occasions popped up and I thought, well, I could spend it here or maybe not or wait till later. And, and I kept it in my Bible bag for a few months and then around December or January, I thought, Lowe's has a spring sale on mulch. And if you catch them at just the right time, you can get five bags of mulch for $10. It's usually like $3 and something. I said, I can get all the mulch I need for my house, and I also need two new gardenia bushes because two of mine in the backyard have died, and I've got three left, and I need to fill in the, the, you know, the dead spots there. I can get two gardenia bushes, and I can get all the mulch I need for my yard with that $70 I had a plan. And I was ready to put my plan into action. And then in early March, the sale was on. 
So I planned on borrowing a truck, and I did. Mark Mayo's truck, he was gracious in allowing me to borrow that. I still don't have a truck. So anyway, y'all pray about that for me, okay? Uh, so I, 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 I go to Lowe's, and I pick out two beautiful gardenia bushes, and you know, you have to purchase the mulch and then take your truck around and they'll load it up. And I walked up to the cashier and I set the gardenia bushes up on the counter there in the garden department. And I said, and I also need this many bags of mulch. And I had already added it all up in my mind and it would be just less than $70. And she rang it up and it was like, Sixty-eight ninety-seven, and with a big smile on my face, I handed her that $70 gift card, and she swiped it. She kind of stood there for a moment, and I thought, okay, and she said, I'm sorry, sir, the card is not good. And I said, well, it has to be. Swipe it again. And she swiped it again, and she looked at the register there, and she said, I'm sorry, sir, the card is not good. And I said, well, I don't understand. It's supposed to be good. Do you have any idea why it wouldn't be good? And she looked at her cash register and she said, it says it's expired. I said, you've got to be kidding me. And she said, yes, sir, it says it's expired. And I said, well, let me see the card. And I looked down at the bottom corner of the card and it said 219. I was just a few days beyond the expiration date. And out the window went my $70, and out of my pocket came my credit card to pay for what I thought I would get, quote, for free. I made a mistake. And I laugh about it now, but it wasn't real funny that day. Uh, I made a mistake. I did not pay attention as I should have and I suffered the consequences. And that's why people don't like making mistakes. It's why I don't like making mistakes. It's because it can be costly. It can cost you something. It can harm a relationship. Mistakes can be costly in a variety of ways. Today we're talking about Peter and his journey into this new normal of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And that journey began with Jesus' words to Peter follow me. And when Jesus spoke those beautiful words to Peter, the Bible says that Peter left his boat, he left his family business to follow Jesus. Now you and I well know, and Peter learned the hard way, following the example of Jesus Christ can be a great challenge. And it's also a great opportunity to make mistakes because as we follow Christ in our fallenness, in our human nature, mistakes will be made along the way. But thanks be to God, God has given us His Holy Spirit to help us overcome our mistakes and, and to go forward with a minimal of mistakes along the way. And as we study Peter's life, we know that Peter made some profound mistakes along the way. Early on, as Jesus began to talk about the fact that he would be betrayed, he would be tried, he would be crucified, he would rise again on the third day, Peter jumps up and says, oh, no, 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 no. He rebukes Jesus for saying that Jesus was going to fulfill God's plan for his life, and Jesus returned uh, the fire back to Peter and rebuked Peter, telling him that he desired the things of man, not the things of God. So we, we see Peter making some mistakes along the way, but Jesus didn't give up on Peter. As a matter of fact, when we read about his life in the Gospels, we're really just seeing... Peter began his journey into the school of discipleship. But on this occasion, where Peter denied knowing Christ three times almost in a row in a very short amount of time, there seems to be the opportunity or the necessity of reconciliation between Peter and Jesus for what he did. And today as we think about this reconciliation that takes place after Jesus' resurrection, that may have happened for a reason other than what we might normally think, and I want to share that with you this morning. So as we think about some of the points we wanted to make in this sermon, we, we do know very clearly that Peter made a huge mistake. And Peter had made mistakes, but on this occasion he made a really big mistake. And Peter was known for overestimating himself on many occasions, but especially when he said he would follow Jesus to the death. 
He said, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Now that sounds like a very prideful statement to me. Even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Matter of fact, Paul gives us some great advice and counsel in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 12, if we find ourselves making statements like this. Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said, If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. We have to be careful to not allow pride to come in and motivate us to make statements and and have actions that truly are not pleasing to God. It would seem that a lot of Peter's words and actions were motivated or, or driven by pride, and if we think about it, pride may have been Peter's besetting sin. This was something I, I learned in seminary that I have held on to very closely, and that's the term besetting sin. Well, when you read in uh, the letter to the Hebrews, it says, lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us. You know, we all struggle with some particular sin more than others. That has been my experience and the experience of others as I've talked to them about their spiritual journey and where they struggle. Besetting sin is that sin you may struggle with the most uh, that causes you the most grief in life when others don't even phase you. So maybe this was Peter's besetting sin, that being pride. So Jesus, uh, Peter says some things that are really out there. If, I, if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. But not only did Peter desert Jesus when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, later on that evening, he denied knowing him three times. So not only did he make the mistake that all the rest of the disciples made in abandoning Jesus, even though the Scripture foretold that event happening, Peter even went further denying Jesus three times in a very short period of time. But you know what? You know, I don't want to paint Peter as a bad person or a bad disciple. Peter had a great, a great zeal to be the best possible disciple that he could be for Jesus Christ. But I wonder if this zeal was motivated by pride or was it motivated by his love for Jesus Christ. It would appear that pride was playing a huge role, at least in this particular point, in Peter's life. So Peter makes a mistake, one of many, just like us. But then we have Jesus. Oh my goodness, Jesus. Jesus knew Peter's mistake was coming and even shared with Peter that it was going to happen and a desired outcome when it happened. Now, I think that's powerful, powerful. Luke 22, verse number 31 and following, Jesus is talking to Peter. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So, when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Here, Peter goes. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. So Jesus knows the mistake, the sin Peter is about to make, and he gives him counsel concerning that very thing. Now then, our mistakes, our sins do not surprise Jesus. Our sins may surprise us, our sins may surprise others, but our sins do not surprise Jesus. And here Jesus even had a plan for Peter in the midst of Peter's denial. It's very evident that Peter was called and gifted to be a leader in the early church, even among those first twelve disciples. And Jesus challenged Peter in that moment to be a leader even in repentance. I think that's one of the most wonderful things a true leader can do is to stand before others and show the example of, I made a mistake, I was wrong, 
I am sorry. You know, we did that with our children growing up. Did you ever make any mistakes with your children as they grew up? Maybe you said one did something and actually you found out later it was the other. Isn't it amazing how they point, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, maybe they did it. And you thought the one who normally did it, did it again, even though they wouldn't fess up. And you got on to them for doing something they didn't do, only to find out later, uh uh-oh, they weren't the ones that did it. There's been occasions in raising our children that Nona and I both have gone back to our kids and said, look, I was wrong, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? But you know what? You might say, I'm a parent. I don't have to do anything like that. Well, if you don't, what kind of example are you setting for your children or even your grandchildren? And if you do, what kind of example are you setting for your children and your grandchildren? Jesus had a plan for Peter even in the, in the midst of Peter's denial of knowing Jesus three times. Now, we need to remember that Peter didn't ultimately abandon his faith or Jesus. He had a crisis of faith like we sometimes do in the midst of our spiritual journey. But even with that coming in Peter's life, Jesus stated he had already prayed for Peter. Now, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's forever making intercession for us. He's praying for us. What does it speak to your heart and mind today? To know that as Jesus sees you journeying into your next mistake, that He's praying for you, that even though you might make a mistake or sin, He's praying that your faith does not fail. He's praying that maybe even from this mistake, we may learn something and grow and mature in a way in which we can help someone else when they find themselves in a similar circumstance. Jesus is praying for us as he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes, Peter had a crisis of faith. Jesus had prayed for his uh, faith to not fail, and his faith did not fail. This reminds me of a little instance in 1 Samuel chapter 12, where the Israelites had, had asked God and asked Samuel for a king. They wanted to be like everybody else in every other nation, God, give us a king. Samuel, give us a king. We want to be like everyone else. And in doing so, they were rejecting the Lord as their king. Samuel was broken hearted about this, and God was not well pleased himself. And God said, okay, I will give them a king. And when Samuel went back to the people and said, God's going to give you a king, but in asking for a king, you have rejected God. And they suddenly realized the error of their way. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. Then Samuel said to the people, Hear this, church. Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness. There was an acknowledgement of their sin. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Serve the Lord out of your love for God, not just because He's given you commands to live by. Serve the Lord out of your love for Him. Do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. And just as was the case here for the Israelites, such was the case with Peter and Jesus and you and I in God. Jesus was not about to forsake Peter and reconciliation was needed and reconciliation was granted. There we read in John 21, 15 through 19, reconciliation. We must note that Peter has been in the presence of Christ at least twice over a period of several days, and thus far, the denial that Peter made had not been mentioned by Jesus. Not a word over several days about this denial Peter had made of knowing Jesus three times before he was crucified. Painful are the hours 
the days that one endures in anticipation of a difficult conversation. Have you ever been at that point in life that you knew you knew a difficult conversation was coming? Either you were the one that was going to have to initiate it, or you were the one that was going to be on the receiving end. Difficult are the hours and the days that you journey through in anticipation of a difficult conversation. But here in John chapter 21, for Peter, the time was at hand. After breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you remember Peter said, if everybody else abandons you, I won't abandon you, Jesus. Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter replies, you know. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Peter, make, Peter makes no mention of, yes, I love you, Jesus, and I love you more than these. He very humbly now says, Yes, you know I love you. But did you take note that Jesus called him Simon? The name he was first known by, not Peter. You remember when Jesus said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church? Now he's calling him Simon. And I think there's importance here. Simon cannot be Peter unless Simon loves Jesus with a very deep, compelling love. And I believe that's the point Jesus is getting at here in this moment of reconciliation. It's all about the love. In John chapter 14, verse 21 Jesus says to his disciples, Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. But we accept his commands and obey them because we love him. Now then, Pride can motivate us to be the best. Pride can motivate us to be the best. Peter wanted to be the best disciple. Pride can motivate us to be the best. But in clearer terms, pride motivates us to be better than others. You get that? Wanting to be the best at who you are or what you do is not necessarily good or bad. It depends upon the motivation. If you want to be the best so that you can be better than everybody else, that's a prideful statement. And it's a very unchristlike statement. But you know what? Out of our love for Christ, we may want to be the best possible disciple we can be. Not so that we can be better than anyone else. Oh, if everyone else leaves, I will never forsake you. That was Peter's first words, prideful words. But now I believe Peter has a different heart. And Jesus is bringing out that different heart in this moment. And it's not a heart filled with pride. It's a heart filled with with love as we read through this account take note that jesus never directly addressed the sin of denial not one time here did jesus say hey pete you remember after you left me in the garden of gethsemane with those people that came to arrest me not only did you abandon me there but also you said to those people out by the fire you didn't even know me i heard you pete I heard you say it. As a matter of fact, one of the Gospels says, I turned and looked at you right after you. Pete, come on now. Not once did Jesus say anything about the denial. Yet Jesus did address the root of the problem. The lack of a compelling love for Christ in Peter's heart. Peter's motivation was rooted in something sinful, pride. It wasn't rooted in a deep love for Christ. 
We too often address the symptoms and fail to address the problem that produces the symptoms. Now, if you've been on the Emmaus walk, you will kind of relate to this a little bit. And if you haven't, I think you can relate to it as well. There is a moment on the Emmaus walk called dying moments where you sit in the chapel and think about the sins in your life that you just need to give to God and, and, and ask for forgiveness and repent and, and live life in a different fashion. And I remember on my Emmaus walk, I sat in the chapel and I had two. It was like I had one for each hand. And I'm sitting there in the chapel and I'm thinking about these two things that I feel like I need to give to God, I need to repent, I need to ask for forgiveness and to go forward in a better fashion. And as I sat there and I thought about that and began to pray, it felt like my prayers weren't getting anywhere. And I just kind of stopped and I thought about what was before me. And very quietly and very gently, the Spirit made very clear that those were the fruit of a deeper issue that needed to be addressed. And if I would address this, those two would go away. It's just like the Bible says when Jesus cursed the fig tree, that it died from the root, so the rest of the tree withered away really quick. So Jesus is addressing a root issue, a core issue, with Peter's pride, hoping and praying and believing that that will be replaced with a deeply felt love for Christ. And I believe that's exactly what happened. When we deal with root problems, the fruit of the root disappears, and we see Peter being transformed into a very different person as we see that lived out in the book of Acts. Yes, you and I make mistakes just like Peter did. But you know what? Just as was the case with Peter is the case with us today. God is not finished with us yet. Jesus is praying for us. God is cheering us on. And maybe even today, a reconciliation and a new normal needs to begin for us as it did with Peter. Right at the end of that conversation that we share from John 21, those last words we read was Jesus saying again to Peter, follow me. A new normal would begin with the same words that began their journey together. Peter, follow me. Have you made a mistake? Have you committed a sin? Be reconciled to Christ and begin again. Jesus is not finished with us either. Maybe just like Peter, we need to begin a new normal today by being reconciled to God and hearing from Him to us those same words. Follow me once again. To God's glory and our blessing. Amen. Amen. We have a hymn of response this